Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Just the one verse that I want to take out of this um, passage. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the, the Great Commission, the, the work that Jesus has left us to do is, yes, it's local work, right? This was, say, Jerusalem is local, but then it expands it to Judea, to Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we as a church, you know, we need to have, uh, you know, the mindset, yes, to, to win our local area, to do work in the local place. And to be honest, my, right now, my plans for a young church is to be focused primarily on Australia, even New Zealand to some extent, Okay. But we're also commanded to look at the uttermost part of the earth, right? We're commanded to have a worldwide mindset when it comes to preaching the Bible. And so this is, in, in a way, this is part two, if you want to look at it that way, from my sermon that I preached Sunday afternoon. On Sunday afternoon, I preached on the church institution. And so I preached on that basically as a, as a, a foundational understanding of what the church is, that it's the body of Christ, okay? And, and you know, Christ died for the church, right? Church is not really this optional thing, right? When, when the, the purpose that God has in our lives is, yes, to get us saved and to get plugged into a church, right? To be a member of a church, the body of Christ. The reason it's called the body of Christ is because Christ, you know, served, you know, performed His ministry in His body and He's given us that work to continue and that work should continue through the body of Christ. It should continue through the local church. And so recently, I've been, I've been sort of in the last sort of few weeks and months, I've been challenged. Uh, I'm not saying challenged in a negative sense. Just, you know, people, you know, we talk about things like, you know, you know, uh, you know missions, missions trips, things like that. You know, what about mission trips? What about, what about, you know, starting churches in other places? You know, what about sending out missionaries and evangelists? You know, what should evangelists do? These kinds of questions. And I thought I'd formulate a few thoughts here and present it to you tonight. So in many ways, this is just continuing on from the study that we started in, on Sunday afternoon. But the title for the sermon tonight is Church Ministries, Local and Broad. Church Ministries, Local and Broad. And by, of course, broad, you know, to the uttermost part of the earth. Now, one of the commandments that the local church has been given in 1 Corinthians 14.40, let all things be done decently and in order, okay? Now, sometimes people have exciting ideas, right? We can do this, we can do that, but I want things to be done decently and in order. That's, what, that's a command that God has given, has given us, and if something looks exciting, something that we can do as a church, but we, you know, we, we're not orderly yet, we don't have the resources, we don't have the people, I don't want to do it, because whatever I do, I want to make sure it's done decently and in order. And so when we think about the local church and the work our church ought to do, it ought to be done decently and in order. That's, that's how Christ did things, decently in order. That's how he's commanded the local church to do things decently and in order. Now, please go to Romans 12. Romans 12, that was one of the passages we left off on Sunday afternoon. Romans 12, let's look at this once again, just a few other verses here. Romans 12, verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3, please. Romans 12, verse 3, it says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So every man, woman, and child that's part of a local body, this is this chapter about the local body, the church, it's told that God has given us a measure of faith, Right? And you keep reading, God has given us different gifts, different abilities to serve in the local church. Verse number four, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so should we all be preachers? No. Okay. Now, if you're not a man, you shouldn't be a preacher behind the pulpit in the first place, right? But could we all be preachers of the gospel? Yes, okay. But the, the teaching here is about the local church, how we ought to conduct ourselves in the local church. We don't all have the same office. We don't all have the same measure of faith. Let's keep going. Verse number five. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So not only are we part of the body of Christ, but we're members one of another, 
Okay? This is why we should care for one another, you know, edify one another, so we can serve each other as we serve Christ. But verse number six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So that's like the measure of faith. It's here it's referring to the grace that has been given to us. We all have different gifts, right? Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Now, prophecy is to proclaim God's word. So that's the preacher, right? The pastor or other preachers that get up here, we've been given that gift. Number seven, or ministry. Let us wait on our ministry. Like that's serving one another. Maybe that's your call, to serve one another. Or he that teacheth on teaching. You see, there are many pastors that can preach God's word, but they're not necessarily good teachers. Now, here's the thing. One of the commandments to be a pastor, to be a bishop, is to be apt to teach, right? So if you're desiring that office, you should be also someone that can teach. You say, what's the difference? Quick example. Let's say a pastor gets behind the pulpit to teach on creation, to teach on the age of the earth, right? Many pastors will get behind the pulpit and say, you know, according to the Bible, the earth is approximately 6,000 years old, whatever, okay? And they're proclaiming the truth. They're proclaiming what the Word of God says, but they won't necessarily teach it, right? Now, a pastor who should be apt to teach should also be able to say, well, this is why it's 6,000 or, you know, 6,000, whatever, you know, 200 years old or whatever, you know, whatever it is, right? This is why. And he starts and explains how we can look at the, the ages of people giving birth. We can give the ages of the time that Israel was in Egypt. We give the times of, of the kings as they reigned through, through Israel up to Christ. And then, you know, teach the fact that this is why we believe what we believe, Right? And that's what differentiates someone that just preaches, and it's fine with just preaching, but also someone who teaches, right? You're grounding that person in that doctrine rather than just proclaiming that doctrine. And so some people have been given the, the, the gift to teach, and pastors should be able to both preach and teach, all right? Let's keep going, verse number eight. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. That's just building up other people. Maybe that's your gift, just to encourage, to build up other people in the Lord. He that giveth. Let him do it with simplicity. You know, some have more finances than others. And those with more are there to give, to give of what they can. Let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Maybe your gift is just to be merciful to other brethren, right? Other brethren that fail, that are struggling, you have the mercy to encourage them, you know, to show them that you love them. Maybe that's your gift. Verse number nine Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So the love, the service that we ought to do to one another ought to be without dissimulation. That's basically saying make sure it's not fake, okay? It's got to be true love, true charity that we have one for another. Now, please go to 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I just wanted to show you all the different gifts that are given to the body of Christ, okay, to serve in the body of Christ, right, to minister in the body of Christ. And what I'm trying to show you guys tonight is that God has called you in a body. If you want to, I say, you, I want to serve God. You know, I want to do some great things for God. You know, it's not about you doing your own thing. You know, it's not just you coming up with your own idea and just doing your own thing. No, you ought to get yourself plugged into the body of Christ and through the body of Christ do those great things, okay? This is what I strongly, strongly believe, okay? And this affects the way I look at mission work or evangelists, these kinds of things, okay? Now, while you're turning to 1 Timothy chapter 3, I'll read to you from, to, uh, from 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, And God have set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. And if you you speak other languages, that's a gift that God has given you to be able to preach the word to people that don't speak English, for example, okay? I mean, here again, we've got different now. This time we've got some titles, apostles, prophets, again, prophets, people that preach the word of God, thirdly, teachers, etc. And so, you know, why don't we we have apostles today? Well, as, you know, Brother Jason was reading through Acts chapter 1, we saw that one of the requirements 
was that they saw the resurrected Christ, okay? And so not only, you know, to be an apostle in the time, you know, to be one of the biblical apostles here, you had to see the resurrection of Christ, you know, the resurrected Christ, but Christ also, you know, in, in one case, like, like, uh, like um, Paul, uh, yeah, Paul, you know, he was hand-selected by Christ himself, right? Hand-selected by Christ himself. That's why we don't have apostles today, because there's nobody here today who has seen the resurrected Christ, right? Christ ascended up into heaven, He's at the right hand side of the Father, and we won't be seeing him physically until his second coming, until the, until the rapture again. So that office is no longer, nobody holds that office any longer, okay? But what we've turned to in 1 Timothy 3 is the office of the bishop. Now, the, the most clear, the most obvious, the most important, the one that's laid out in detail for us in the Bible is the office of the bishop. Not just here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but also in Titus chapter 1, okay? Two references to this, to this office. Let's have a look at it very quickly. 1 Timothy 3, 1. This is a true saying that if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire for good work. And now we get qualifications. We get a whole list of things this bishop ought to stand for. A bishop must... Uh, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. There's the apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, nor covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being filled up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So that was the, those are the qualifications there of a bishop. What are the key things that we see there? That he's a family man. He's married with kids, right? Number one. Number two, he's got great character about him, okay? And number three, that he is apt to teach. Like he's got knowledge. He knows the Bible well, right? He's someone that knows the Bible well. He's able to teach God's word. And if we keep going, look at verse number 8, we now have the deacons, okay? The deacon is the next office that's given to us with great detail. Number 8, likewise. So really the deacon must be almost identical to the pastor there. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given too much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. Remember that, this person needs to be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So we see many of the same qualifications for a deacon, the same as a pastor. But what else do we see? The deacon must be a family man once again. Right? A wife, faithful children. These, these ideas, right? A family man, okay? Husband of one wife. And uh, I want you to keep that in mind because now go to Acts chapter 6, please. Go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Now, New Life Baptist Church, we have here the office of a bishop, right? That's myself, you know, serving in that office, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I believe that, the, you know, the, the term bishop, pastor, and elder are terms, and I've preached on this before, used interchangeably in the Bible for the same office, okay? The same office, but those different names kind of point to a different role that that person plays as well in, in the um, house of God. So we wanted to just look at deacons first, because this will lead us to the, to, the, to the office of an evangelist, okay? Let's look at the first deacons that we see in the Bible here in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And it, once again, we've seen that the deacon has to be married with kids, okay, faithful children. So when we see these first deacons being appointed to work in the church, guess what? They're married with kids, okay? They're not single guys doing whatever they want, okay? They're, they're married with kids and they're serving in the church. The other thing that I, I missed the point, the other thing about the deacon that was mentioned in verse number 10, it said, not in, not in Acts, um, back in uh, 1 Timothy, it says, let the, sorry, um, it said, and let these also first be proved, okay? So before we select a deacon, if we need a deacon in our church, they have to be proved. They have to be proven. You say, who proves them? The local church, the body of Christ. That's where they're proved, right? Proved to be faithful members, proved to be doing the work of God, 
proved to know the Word of God. That's how they're proved. That's not their own opinion of themselves. All right? They are proved by the church. Then they're appointed to this office. And we see the same thing play out here in Acts chapter 6. So far, we're just focused on the local church, the local ministry in the church. We haven't gone abroad yet, right? Look at verse number 1, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So we have a situation where this church in Jerusalem, it's growing, there's more disciples added, but the Grecian widows were being neglected. And so we see that it was the church's responsibility here to, take, to look after the widows, right? They've got no husband, they've got no, um, I guess, children that can look after them. And so if they're faithful widows to the church, that's a command for the church to look after that widow if she has that need. And so that task of the church was being neglected. Verse number two, then the 12, those are the 12 apostles, called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So the, 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 the apostles are getting really busy, right? They want to serve with the Word of God. They want to be preaching the Word of God, you know, you know winning souls and, and preaching, teaching the local church. But they were you know, getting caught away by doing these other jobs. This is why uh, this was being neglected. They couldn't do all this work. And then it says here in verse number 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out amongst yourselves, uh, among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So he says, look, look out amongst yourself. He says, look, look, who's proven themselves is what he's saying, right? Who's proven themselves to be hard workers, good church members, people full of the Holy Ghost that we may appoint to the business, the stuff to, you know, that, that is being neglected in the church. Verse number four, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith of the Holy Ghost and Philip. Now, Philip's the one we're going to focus on as we move on and uh, Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, so they ordained them there, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient uh, to the faith. So we see when a church needs deacons, right? Not only do we have qualifications, but when when the work of the church is starting to be neglected, not because the the, the apostle or the leadership is lazy, they just got too much on, they can't keep up, that's when a church would need to appoint a deacon to help assist in those matters. Now, one of the things we see here is they they were looking after the widows, right? Things like that. Now, you know, this is not a command, this is not saying that deacons have to look after widows, okay? We take the greater lesson here. Things that are being neglected, right? Let's say one day, I don't know, you know, the the maintenance of the church is being neglected or something, right? I mean, whatever need might come up in this church, right? And and where I can't feel that anymore, I've got too much on my plate, I can't feel that anymore, then we'll get a, you know, we'll look at getting a deacon that can serve in those areas. Whatever it is that's being neglected, right? That's where the deacon is an assistant to the ones that are in authority. In this case, it was the uh, apostles, but the apostles today, we don't have them. And so, you know, the lesson here is that they would be that assistant to the bishop, the office of the, of the bishop. But once again, notice the second name that was given there in verse number five was Philip. Philip, right? And Philip was a deacon, okay? He served in that role. So once again, was Philip married? He had to be. Those are the qualifications of being a deacon. Did he have kids? He had to have kids. Were they unruly? Were they, no, they were, must have been faithful children, right? In order to be able to fill this role, to fill this capacity. Now, the reason I, I want to focus on Philip now is because we do have an office of an evangelist that's taught in us, uh, taught, taught to us from the Bible, okay? But there's only one man that we read about that holds that office. Now, he's not the only man that holds that office, okay? But he's the only one that we know of by name, and we can follow his story and see what he does. Okay, and so when we start thinking about evangelists, an evangelist, some, an evangelist is someone that preaches the gospel, right? You know, whether we need someone to preach the gospel full time in the local area, or we send someone. A lot of people, you know, send out missionaries, or there are missionaries to support. I personally, I want to find a missionary to support, and there are missionaries out there to support. Okay, but you'll soon see why. Why I withhold from supporting certain ministries or uh, um, um, 
missionaries, but really the name these missionaries have in the Bible are evangelists, okay? Because they're out there doing the work of evangelism, preaching the gospel to the lost. So let's now go to Ephesians 4, please. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Let's learn about the evangelist. So we, we looked at the office of, a, of the uh, apostles that's done away with, the office of a bishop now, the office of a deacon. Those guys are there to serve the local church, right? Church ministries, local ministries, those are the officers that are held in that official capacity of leadership. Now, do you think we need evangelists for the body of Christ? Do, do you think we need them? I, I, I agree with you. I agree, but do we need them to, in, 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 to do their ministry of evangelism to the local church, though? I mean, the local church is supposed to be made up of saved, born-again, baptized believers, right? So why would saved, born-again, baptized believers need to hear the gospel again from an evangelist? Just by the title evangelist, doesn't that mean that person is going outside of the body and t- preaching the gospel? I mean... Obviously, right? Common sense. That's what we, you know, that's why they've got that name. Now, Ephesians 4 4, please. Ephesians 4 4. Look at this. Ephesians 4 4. There is one body. Now, what was that one body that we learnt? The church, the body of Christ, okay? And one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So here's another teaching about the gifts that uh, God gives us, right, to serve in that one body. Drop down to verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, with an S. So were there more than one evangelist? Yes, okay. Now we only know really of Philip who becomes an evangelist. That's the only one we know of. But we know there are definitely more evangelists, right? Because it's got an S there. It's plural. And some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So when we see the evangelists here, they are there to serve in the local church. They're there to be members of the local church, right? And to serve one another. But notice in verse number 12, it says, for the perfecting of the saints. Now again, do the saints need to be saved again or hear the gospel again? No. Okay, but then read the rest of it. For the work of the ministry. So an evangelist's job outside of the church is a work of the ministry of the local church as well. Okay, and so that's where the evangelist would fit in not to have authority within the local church, but to go out of the local church and preach the gospel, right? Preach the gospel. And um, if you guys can now go to um, Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We're going to follow Philip in the book of Acts a little bit here. We're going to learn more about the evangelist here. Okay, so again, the, the sermon here is local church, doing local ministries, and broader ministries as well, okay? So Acts chapter 8, please. And while you're turning to Acts chapter 8, it says in 2 Timothy 4, 5, speaking of the church bishop, of the church pastors, but watch thou in all things, and do our afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So what's a pastor commanded to do as well? To do the work of an evangelist, okay? So pastors, bishops, are required to get out there and give out the gospel as well, all right? And many pastors don't do it. Many, in fact, I was talking to one guy recently, and he's talking about a former pastor that he had, and he's like, he, just, he wasn't interested in any evangelism. Right? He wasn't interested in going out there and preaching the gospel to the lost. Well, then that man needs to step down, okay, because he's not feel, fulfilling the role of a, of a pastor. That's when you stop paying the guy, all right? I mean, that's when you say, you pull back, you look, you're not doing the work, that God has left you to do. And so listen, if I drop daughter or soul winning, right? If, if I'm not out there, guys, you need to raise that with me and say, look, you're not doing the work that a pastor has been called to do. You're also called to do the work of an evangelist, okay? But let's look at the evangelist now. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. We're following the story of Philip. Now, we haven't seen, we've seen that Philip is a deacon. We haven't seen yet that he's an evangelist. But notice how God uses him here 
Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And Philip said, this is when Philip goes to the Ethiopian eunuch, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, that's, thou mayest get baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So what do we see? Not just a pastor is to do the work of an evangelist, but we see a deacon here, right? Doing the work of an evangelist. He's going and preaching the gospel. And verse number 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So what do we see here? We see that someone who has the office of a deacon, remember he's there, a deacon in the Jerusalem church, he's also preaching the gospel, he also has the authority there to baptize a new convert, okay? And it's, it's my belief what we will do in this church is that, you know, a, a person that holds the office, either of a bishop or a deacon, they will be the ones that are permitted to perform baptisms in our, in our church, you know? I don't believe in this free-for-all thing, okay? I believe in the work of the, of the body of Christ, the local body of Christ, that we're commanded to do this work. And so we see Philip doing this work as an evangelist as well. Now go to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, please. Acts chapter 21, verse 8. Acts chapter 21, verse 8. And now we're going to be introduced once again to Philip, but now he's an evangelist, okay? So all we're doing right now, we're just taking facts, just things that we're seeing in the Bible, right? And then I'm going to give you my thoughts on all this, all right? And I understand, look, there's a saying that goes, you know, there's, there's many ways to skin a cat. I, I understand. You know, I'm not expecting every church to believe like me, to do things exactly the same as me. You know, I'm not going to look down and disgrace and go against churches that don't believe things exactly like I do when it comes to church ministry. But I just want this local church to know what I believe. And to be honest with you, when I started this church, I didn't really fully know what I believe. When it came to some of this stuff, this, this, you know, you get challenged, right? People ask you questions, things you don't really think about, things that you don't think you need to think about for a while, and then you need to study and get an answer, all right? So I'm the kind of guy that I just want to go to the Bible, I want to see what they're doing in the Bible, and then just pattern our church as closely as we can with what the Bible says. Other people, you know, instead of trying to be as close as what the Bible says, other people will look for the loopholes and say, well, the Bible doesn't really say, so we can, and they'll stretch their hand beyond, all right? I don't want to do that. Now, if another church does that, fine. What did we learn on Sunday afternoon? That every church has to give an account to Christ. Every pastor, you know, has to give an account of their own independent church, okay? So I'm not, look, if someone's a brother in Christ, they're doing things a certain way, God bless them, all right? I hope they, have, they win many souls. I hope they're serving the Lord at the full capacity as much as they can. That doesn't mean I'm going to go and copy what another church does, okay? What we do as a church has to come from as best as I understand what the Word of God says. I have to have a clear conscience before God with how we go ahead and do things. So I'm not looking for the loopholes. I'm just looking for the pattern we see and try and do the best we can to follow after that pattern. Verse number uh, 8, please. Acts 21, verse 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. Now, Caesarea is about a two-day journey from Jerusalem. Okay, two-day journey from Jerusalem. And then it says here, and we enter, and by journey, I mean walking, obviously in those days, right? I mean, it's probably like a two-hour drive or something like that, if you had a car, okay? And came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven. So we definitely know this is the same guy that was made a deacon before, right? But now he's an evangelist. Now he's in Caesarea. He's got a house there. And it's, two, it's a two-day journey from the, his local church, okay? So what do we see here? Well, he's an evangelist. He's doing work outside of the local body of Christ, you know? He's, he's in this city, you know, winning souls, doing the work of an evangelist. And it says, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So even his daughters were out there preaching the gospel with him, okay? So did he have faithful children? Absolutely, right? You can see that when we look at his life, it lines up with the same qualifications that you would see of a deacon or, or a bishop, right? Verse number 10, And we tarried there many days. There came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. Now, this is important, okay? So we have this prophet named Agabus. He's coming from Judea, okay, to see 
uh, the, this group of believers there in Caesarea, all right? Now, keep your finger there in Acts 21. We're going to come back. Please go to Acts 11. Let's learn a little bit more about Agabus, okay? Uh, Acts 11, please. Acts 11, verse 27. Acts 11, verse 27. Because is Philip, okay, he's two days' journey from his local church. But is Philip just doing his own thing, do you think? Look, obviously the Bible doesn't give us this level of detail, right? Is he doing his own thing? Is he just saying, you know what, my house is in Caesarea, you know, I'm just going to go and do my own work here in Caesarea. Is that what's going on? Or do you think he's still under the authority of his local church in Jerusalem? My personal take on this is I still believe he's working under the authority of his local church. And I'll tell you why. And I believe Agabus is the main, you know, connection that we can see this. We can see here, right? Agabus. Look at Acts 11, please. Acts 11, verse 27. Acts 11, verse 27. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. So the most famous churches at the beginning of of the New Testament era is the church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch when they were first called Christians, right? And we have preachers coming from, or prophets here, coming from Jerusalem, from the Jerusalem church, to the Antioch church. Verse number 28, And there stood up one of them named Agabus. There he is. And signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So what do we learn? That the church in, in Jerusalem now had elders. They now had pastors, right? And this relief, this help for the time of famine, of, of drought to come, was being sent from the church in Antioch to the church in Jerusalem. And the one that the Jerusalem church sends to pass on this message is Agabus, all right? So then what do we, what do we then, if we can go back to Acts 21, what would be, to, for me anyway, the, 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 just the natural reading of this, is Agabus is being sent by the local church once again to uh, Philip, right? Why? Because Philip's part of, the, part of that church. He's operating as an evangelist, and there's a command coming from, a, from somebody that's sending a message from the Jerusalem church um, onto um, Philip. Let's keep going there. Acts 21, verse 11. Acts 21, verse 11. And when he was come unto us, that's Agabus, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now look at verse 12. And when we heard these things, both we, that's Paul's company, and they of that place, that's um, uh, Philip the Evangelist and his whatever family and entourage that he has, of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. All right. So we have Agabus coming, issuing a, an instruction, a command, a word of God from the Jerusalem church coming to instruct them at the house of Philip the Evangelist. And so what I believe we're seeing here is that the local church in Jerusalem had sent out, maybe they didn't need him as, as a deacon anymore in the local church. He's only two days' journey, so he can come back and forth and report of, of his work. And he's out there in Caesarea, maybe because he already had a house there, and he's being used to preach the gospel to the people there. Okay, being used like what we would term an, a missionary, an evangelist. All right? What I don't see here is a guy just doing his own thing. It looks like he's reporting directly back to the church in Jerusalem. That would make a lot of sense because, again, the evangelist was for the purpose of the body of Christ. Remember that? We saw that he was there as a, as a, a summon to, that holds an office that's been given a gift to serve in the local church. It would make no sense to me to, to give somebody the office of an evangelist that is not operating under a local church, okay? I'm just trying to show you what the Bible says here, right? And, and I believe this, is, this, this should be your natural reading of the Bible there. I don't, I don't think I'm getting overly complicated, okay? We should strive, whatever ministry it is to do, whatever it is to do for the Lord, we ought to do it through the local church, okay? Now, if you can uh, please go to, uh, let's see, where can I get you to turn to now? Um, please go to Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9. Now, while you turn there, the reason I wanted to talk about that, brethren, is because, again, you know, being challenged in a good way, you know, why can't we... You know, why can't I just sell my thing, sell everything that I have, 
you know, go into, you know, a highly receptive area, let's say the Philippines or somewhere in Africa or somewhere in South America where people are poor, you know, I, I can sustain myself, I can have, you know, a lot, you know, I can look after, I can provide for myself. You know, what's wrong with me just selling all that I have, getting out there where it's hyper-receptive and just doing the work of God, just preaching the gospel? Well, doing that in of itself, is there's nothing wrong with it in of itself, okay? But what we see in the Bible, the pattern that we see in the Bible is that it is a work of the local church, that you're still under the authority of a local church. You're still able to report back to that local church. That local church is still able to send messages to you, you know, via email, I guess now, right, or whatever. You know, you're still reporting back. There's still a connection there back and forth. You know, and, and you know, I just, what I don't want, like, look, other churches might be doing other things. I don't care. They're accountable to God, right? Praise God if they're serving God. You know, people that do their own thing and go their own way, sell everything they have to preach the right doctrine, you know, I've got their backs. They're my brother in Christ. I want them to do well, but I'm not accountable for that person. I am accountable for what we do in this church now. I am accountable for the people that are the members of this church. And here's the thing. If you say to me, you know what, I really just want to go and serve the Lord out there, I'm probably going to jump at that opportunity and say, well, is this possible? You know, are you able to, you know, we're a small church, we're not able to necessarily provide everything you need at this point in time, but maybe you can provide half, maybe the church can provide half. Hey, we'll send you out there, but you come back and report back. You still be part of this church. This is your standing church. We saw that the church is an umbrella of God's protection as well, okay? And so we want to make sure that everything that we do, whatever it is, you know, work that is ministry that is abroad is done under the umbrella of a local church. And sometimes I, I hear these stories, you know, so-and-so has gone out there, you know, he's serving the Lord. Great, great, okay? But is he reporting back to a church? Does he have a part? We should support so-and-so. We should support this missionary. We should support, look, uh, thank God he's out there doing the work of God. But who, who's his pastor? What church is he operating under? I don't know. I'm not going to support it then. All right? So if I have certain rules that I can, certain patterns that I see in the Bible and certain rules that I want to base our ministries on, then I need to make sure whatever we support as a church is following that same pattern, okay? And we look at the evangelist. What was the evangelist able to do? He was someone that had the same, he, he served as a deacon, okay? He was married with children, right? And so if that evangelist was able to, you know, establish a, you know, many, many, get many people saved and they wanted to start a church, guess what? That guy has the qualifications to be a pastor one day. It's not that he's disqualified from that, right? You could see that being the natural progression of that, right? Of potentially starting a church in Caesarea and having Philip become the pastor because we already know he meets the qualifications of a bishop, I mean, of a deacon, and they pretty much line up, okay? And so, of course, I, look, like I said, this is just a pattern that I see in the Bible. This is what I want to follow, okay? I'm not looking for what the Bible didn't say. I'm not looking for the loopholes, okay? And I know we could all find a million loopholes, right? And do things however way we want. And so, you guys, where did I ask you to turn to? Mark chapter 9. While you turn to Mark 9, I'll just read to you from 1 Corinthians 7.32. You know, Paul says, but I would have you without carefulness that he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, that he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth, uh, careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. So right now I'm looking at what about situations. What about here? Paul says that you're better if you're not married. You'll be able to do more for the Lord. Well, praise God, you know. If a church, you know, if you're someone that's unmarried, if you're someone that has the resources, you have the desire to preach the gospel, praise God for you. You know, you don't have a family that you, that's going to, you know, use up your time. You can be used for the Lord. You can still be sent to do great works for God. You can still be sent in places to serve Him, but I'm not going to ordain you an evangelist. Okay? You're not going to have that office because I believe the evangelist needs to line up with the qualifications of the deacon. That's what we see with, Pete, with Philip. Why should I have a lower standard than what we see in the Bible? Okay? So you can still serve the Lord. You can still get out there. But here's the difference, brethren. If you are able to have the qualifications, you are an evangelist, we send you out to the foreign field, then by that, what I had already mentioned, you'll also be able to perform baptisms as an evangelist, right? As someone that holds that office. But if you're being sent out from this church anyway, 
and you don't meet the qualifications of a bishop or a deacon, and you can get out there and preach the gospel, but you're not going to be doing baptisms. And where I would send you is if we can find a good church, right, that has a pastor, that already has a local church there, that if you get people saved, they can go to that local pastor and find, get, them, get themselves baptized. So this would have an effect of where I would send certain people, right? If someone is married with the kids and has the qualifications, that's the person that I would most likely send to a place that has no good church to win souls. And the guy that doesn't have those qualifications that I wouldn't ordain as an evangelist, I would rather send you to work with another church, you know, or to get yourself plugged into another church where they can, you know, uh, see the needs of those people you get saved. That's how I want to operate, okay? I'm just sharing my thoughts here uh, with you. And then uh, we have Matthew 19, verse 12, for there are some eunuchs, these are the words of Jesus, which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So just because you, you, you might make yourself a eunuch, you might say, I never, I'm never going to get married. I just want to commit my, the rest of my life to the kingdom of God, to serve the Lord. Praise God if he's given you that gift, okay? But once again, I'm not going to ordain you. I'm not going to ordain you evangelist. I'm not going to give you the permission to conduct baptisms, all right? We need to do things decently and in order, okay? Decently and in order. You guys are in Mark 9. Look at Mark 9. So this is another one that comes up with my train of, of beliefs or thoughts here. And John answered, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. All right, so what do we see? We see uh, this was a, a situation brought up to me. It says, look, you know, this guy that's casting out devils, that's not following after Christ, he seems to be like part of some other church or not part of any church, right? What about this guy? And, and Christ says, you know, don't forbid him. Well, look, once again, if other churches do things differently to what I believe we ought to do, I'm not going to forbid him from preaching the gospel. He's not part of our local church, right? But here's the other thought that you need to consider when it comes to this passage. The New Testament is still not in effect, okay? We're still operating under the Old Testament. Why can this man cast out devils in the name of Jesus? Obviously, well, what we've seen in the Bible is they could only do it when Jesus gave them the ability, gave them the power to do those things. So when we look at that, obviously Jesus at some point crossed paths with this guy, told him to do the work, and he's doing the work, but he didn't follow after Christ, right? I mean, a great example of this is when Jesus uh, passes over to the coast of Gentiles, and there's that demon-possessed man, right? And, and, and Jesus heals the man, the man gets saved, he wants to follow after Christ, and Christ says, no, don't follow me, you stay in your city, and you preach the word of God. And that's what he does, right? He's not following after Christ, but he's doing the work of Christ. And so listen, brethren, say, what about this church? What about that church? They don't do it the way you believe. Well, I'm not going to forbid them. You know, if that's how their pastor wants to do it, if they want to be accountable to that for God, to God, go for it. I'm, I'm happy for them to do it that way, you know. But I'm going to try to pattern myself after what I see in the Scriptures as much as I possibly can, okay? I would rather err on the side of caution rather than err on the side of error, okay? So um, then we have... Uh, if you guys can please go to Acts chapter 9, please. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And there is a principle here that I want to mention, okay? And uh, this is that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15, 22, And Samuel said, Have the Lord as great, de Have the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. This is a great teaching in the Bible. To obey is better than sacrifice. You might say, look, I'm willing to sacrifice it all. I'm going to quit my job, quit my work, quit, you know, sell everything that I have. Get out there. Okay, there's no good church. There's nothing there. But I'm just going to get out there and just serve the Lord for the rest of my life. I'm going to sacrifice everything I have for the Lord. Well, you can do that. I mean, I'm not going to stop you if you really want to do that. I can't stop you, right? But I don't believe you're in obedience to what we see in the Word of God. You know, if you want to do something like that, you need to do it through a local church. Whether it's this local church or you get yourself plugged into another local church, 
that can oversee you and commission the work that you're doing. Okay. Uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. Let's get this lesson here in Acts chapter 9, please. Acts chapter 9, verse 17. Let's have a look at the Apostle Paul here. Acts chapter 9, verse 17. It says, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put in his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the ways in the way that thou camest, have sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from him, uh, from his eyes as he had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. So this is Paul, the Apostle Paul. Well, getting saved, getting baptized, verse 19, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then were sold certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So what do we learn with Paul? He gets saved, he gets baptized, he's excited for the Lord, he gets out there um, and, uh, and preaches that, uh, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Drop down to verse number 23, Acts 9.23. And after that, many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying await was none of soul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. All right, so what do we learn with Paul? Paul's got a lot of zeal. He gets saved, he gets baptized, he gets out there preaching Christ. Praise God for him, right? He's a great example of a man. But he does his own thing, right? He does his own thing. He gets out there, preaches Christ. He finds himself in trouble. They've got to save his life. They deliver him in a basket from the, from the, down the wall. And then he decides, well, I better go to Jerusalem, right? And there in verse number 26, he says here that, um, uh, verse, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. He says, man, I better join the church, is what he's saying, right? He's out there doing his own thing. It didn't really work out. I mean, he's doing it for the Lord, right? I'm not going to forbid him. I'm not going to say you're an idiot, Paul. But then he realized, man, I've got to get in church. That's what he does, right? He goes to Jerusalem, tries to find the, the local church there. And now go to Acts 13, please. Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 1. We see the lesson there of a man just does his own thing. He probably got people saved. We don't know. We don't get, we, we're not told if he got anyone saved, right? Uh, but then Acts 13, verse 1. This is many, many years later in the life of Paul, all right? He goes back to Tarsus. He gets the training of the Word of God into him, and then God is able to use him. Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, that's Saul, that's Paul, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Guess what? Paul, from being sent out here, is able to accomplish great things. Great work. And he's being sent by his local church. He's being sent there by the church of Antioch. All right, Being commissioned by that church. And he's being sent out there. He gets many people saved. He starts, off, he starts many churches. But what do we see the difference there? One, one thing, he gets saved without the authority of his local church. He just does the work of God, finds himself in trouble. He's got to take pause, get training, learn once again. Then he finds himself in church, finds himself many years later in the church of Antioch. Now he's ready. Now he's ready to do the work of God. But once again, it's come through the local umbrella of, you know, of the church, right? It's come through that ministry. And so I thought that was quite interesting, right? We see an example here of Paul doing his own thing, not really working out, but once he's plugged into a church, once the church has commissioned him and sent him out, then, then he was able to accomplish great things uh, for God. So obedience is better than sacrifice, okay? Doing things in accordance to God's word. Now, let me just stop and, and say a couple more things about the office of the evangelist. We may find ourselves one day needing this office, okay? And, you know... There's two, two thoughts that I have here. Let's say, you know, you know, let me just use Brother Sam for an example, because Brother Sam has a heart for missions. You know, very clearly, he has a heart to, you know, see as many souls saved, especially in the foreign fields, right? Things like that. He's done a lot of that in the past. 
And uh, let's say one day Brother Sam just, you know, has that, that desire, comes back to him and says, you know what, I need to get out there. What's a country that needs, needs the gospel? Lebanon. Lebanon, right? He goes, I want to get out there to Lebanon, right? But, you know, it's, it's not something full-time. You know, it's just something like, a, let's say, a solid month. I'm going to get out there for a month, serve the Lord, win as many souls as possible. You know, and if there's someone that is able, at that point, that measures up to the qualifications of a deacon, you know, uh, at that point, you know, I'd be like, yeah, let's get on board, right? Let's send him out as an evangelist for that month. I'd lay my hands on him, ordain him as an evangelist. He'd get out there, win souls, and he'll be able to baptize new converts as well. You know, he comes back after that month, let's say, brings back a report of what he's done, and he's done the duty of his office at that point in time. That would be like a temporary position as an evangelist, right? He comes back. But there might be a future opportunity. We don't know. Maybe not even someone in this church, but someone else, right? Now, let's just use our church, for example. And says, you know what, I believe that, you know, the best place for me is to go to Papua New Guinea, right? And, uh, you know, I, you know I, maybe at that, at that point, the church has the resources to send that person there to provide their needs on a daily basis. That person may become a full-time evangelist, right? At that point, I would ordain that person again, as long as they meet the qualifications of a deacon, you know, ordain that man, send him out there. He has the qualifications. So it'll be winning souls getting people baptized, he's there for the long haul, that person may eventually be able to have a group of believers and start establishing a church. Again, that would be a church, though, that's sending the work, right? And the church commissioning the beginning of another church. And if that person has, is able to meet those, you know, has those qualifications, he can then step up to be the deacon or even be the pastor, the, the bishop, and then look after that local church. And that would be its own independent church at that point in time. That would be the way I want to operate. You know, you say, well, I don't meet those qualifications. Can I still be sent out to do the work of God? Absolutely. Once again, I just wouldn't ordain you as an evangelist. Get out there. Find a good church. Maybe there's another church doing a missions program. Go with them. You know, help them out. Maybe we can support you a little bit as well, right? Do the work and do great things for the Lord. You know, get out there, but find a church that you can get yourself plugged into. And once again, if you come back from that, hey, come back and report to us. Report to us of the great things that God was able to do for you, okay? So that's all I wanted to cover today. It really is part two of what I preach um, Sunday afternoon. Those are my thoughts on how I want to operate things as a church, okay? Now, if you agree with me, great. Now, what I don't want you to do, though, is find some other church that does it differently and say you're doing it wrong, okay? Because, again, we just have the stories. We see how things play out. Once again, I just want to do things as closely as I see there in the Bible. Okay, I don't want to ordain someone an evangelist just because I can find a loophole and do it. No, I'd rather do it because the evangelist I see was also a deacon. He also had those qualifications. So I want to make sure he can do that. Not only was he a deacon, he was able to baptize as well. And that's what we see in the Bible. We see men that hold these offices that are, are the ones that are, are doing the baptisms. We don't see in the Bible the regular Joe Blow doing baptisms. Okay, Things ought to be done decently and in order and through uh, the local church. All right, let's pray.